The air is cool on a mid-March morning as we find ourselves on the southern outskirts of the town of Alturas in California's Modoc County that occupies the state's far northeastern corner. Here the crew of the Goose Lake Railway, no doubt missing their warm beds as we are, are preparing to return their train back home on the second part of a two-day, 110-mile return trip from the railway's base in Lakeview, Oregon to Alturas, California and back. Underway, let us take a look at what is quite possibly Oregon's most remote railroad. The town of Lakeview resides in Oregon's southeastern region. Unlike the western regions of Oregon, the southeast is a land of wide open tundra, rugged ranges, inland lakes, and natural wonders hosting a very dry climate with towns few and far between. Known as the Oregon Outback, this high desert basin and range region spans Kalamath, Harney, Malheur, and Lake Counties, of which the latter is where we find ourselves today. Named in recognition of the numerous lakes within its boundaries, Lake County is home to just over 8,100 residents over an area of 8,275 square miles, resulting in a population density of just one person per square mile. The county boasts a rugged, remote landscape that is covered in history and lore. It is within this landscape that we find today's Goose Lake Railway and their base of operations in the county's largest town of Lakeview. From here, the Goose Lake Railway operates the 55-mile branch from the town of Lakeview, Oregon, south to its current interchange with the Union Pacific Railroad at Lakeview Junction, just outside the town of Alturas, California. The history of the line tells a story of anticipation, hope, and a constant struggle for survival from the elements and economic viability. Having seen several owners since its opening and fair share of challenges throughout the years, it continues to provide a vital link for the industries and community of Lakeview to the rest of the continental U.S. We will follow the crew from Lakeview in this two-part documentary as they make their weekly journey south across the border and back through some of Oregon and California's remote yet breathtaking scenery. On the way, we will explore the early history of towns such as Fairport and New Pine Creek, then onwards to Willow Ranch, Davis Creek, and Surprise Station, finishing in Alturas, which was the final home of the Nevada, California, Oregon Railway, whose aspirations built the route that we see today. Winding the clock back 36 hours, we are in Lakeview on a Friday afternoon and find the Goose Lake Railway Center of Operations on the west side of town. Here we find the company's depot and maintenance shed alongside the main track with a siding where we find a number of interesting items tied down. First of which is an SD7U numbered 926, which still carries the name of its previous owner, the Central California Traction. This unit started life as Santa Fe's number 2868 before going on to work for the Alameda Beltline, where it received the livery it still wears today. This unit currently is in need of major work, but the plan is to see it running as the railway's third unit. Next in line are three HLCX leasing units, which were leased by the Goose Lake Railway as interim power until they could acquire power of their own. Currently not being used by the Goose Lake, they are being stored here for the owner until their next assignment. More references to the past can be seen with Southern Pacific flat cars as well as the old SP caboose, rather crudely lettered for one of the line's previous operators, Great Western Railway. Just south of the depot, we catch today's crew moving their train south, having collected all the outbound cars from the customers on the north end of town and positioning it for tomorrow's crew.
ride down at the southern end of the town, we get a clear view of the train in the evening light. Somewhat of a surprise for us on our second trip to record this line was that two of the lease units were in this train as they were starting their journey to go serve on the Coos Bay rail line in Western Oregon. Arriving back the following morning in the early hours, the next crew has boarded the train and proceeds to depart. By the encroaching dawn, we can see the contours of the Warner Mountains as the train starts to roll south out of town. The first 14 miles of our journey will take us to the state border with California. The track is a series of long straights on level ground running through open farmland, allowing for easy viewing of the train's progress from Highway 395, which parallels the line. Four miles south of Lakeview, the cowbirds provide a morning course as the sky begins to brighten on the railway's two GP15-1s, trundling past Crane Creek Road at the line's maximum speed allowed of 10 miles per hour. Named after Captain William H. Warner of the U.S. Corps of Topographical Engineers, the Warner Mountains are now clear to see, defining the eastern edge of the Goose Lake Basin. Captain Warner was tasked with finding possible railroad crossings of the Sierra Nevadas. Warner, however, was killed by Native Americans in these mountains on one related expedition, and his remains were never found. Though not as high as the neighboring Cascade and Sierra Nevada ranges, they nevertheless stand tall and imposing on the eastern edge of the Goose Lake Valley, a barrier to pioneers and railroaders throughout the ages. Our train continues onward, passing a herd of cows unfazed by the slow-moving southbound hauler. Our leader today is number 614, an ex-Union Pacific Yard unit, and despite its appearance, is the newest locomotive on the Goose Lake Railway. In tow is number 106, an ex-CSX unit, which no doubt the crews are thankful is fitted with air conditioning for the hot summer days. Now eight miles south of Lakeview, our train passes the northern extent of Goose Lake. Over the next 20 miles, the line follows the historic edge of the lake, and also acts as a separation between the alkaline mudflats and the land used for agriculture. Now significantly smaller than in the past, Goose Lake was at its recorded largest between 1908 and 1912, just as the Nevada-California-Oregon Railway was making its way north from Alturas to Lakeview, measuring 30 miles long and 7.5 miles at its widest. Today, as we can see though, the lake is more of a series of small bodies of water surrounded by mudflats. Goose Lake is always changing depending on the rains that come each year and the length of the dry spells that follow. Indeed, the lake has dried up 11 times since records began in 1851 when settlers first came to the valley. From the ground, the impact of the lake is hard to gauge until one views it from above, giving aid to the imagination as to what would have been beheld by railroad laborers and locals alike as they made their way up the valley. 
Rejoining our chase, we take a more direct route than the railroad to the border with California and the community of New Pine Creek on Highway 395 as the line continues along the lakeside. Home to 120 people, New Pine Creek is considered part of Oregon even though it lies south of the 42nd parallel, a line which is generally considered to be the divide between both states. Due to a mistake by a heavy drinking surveyor, the state border ended up going through the town instead of north of it. As a result, New Pine Creek straddles the border between Oregon and California, resulting in some unique issues for its residents living in the town with both Oregon and Californian postcodes. The town is also considered to be the oldest settlement in Lake County, and the most southerly settlement in the state of Oregon. Now in California, the morning light bathes the Goose Lake Basin in a golden hue. Our train and its crew, dwarfed by the landscape, continue southward. The line continues to follow the lake edge until going around the promontory of Sugar Hill south of Willow Ranch. In the background, we can just make out the current extent of the lake. Much of this region at the time of settlement was used for the raising of livestock, and this would be the main part of the economy into the 1930s. With no easy way to get livestock to market, the communities needed a better option, and what better hope than a railroad? First organized in 1879 by entrepreneur John T. Davis as the Western Nevada Railroad Company, the plan was to build a line from Wadsworth, Nevada, south to connect a number of mining camps in the region. However, with competition from the plans of the Carson and Colorado and Nevada-Arizona railroads, a new plan was formed to build a line from Reno, Nevada, south to Bodai, California, and north to the Columbia River, taking advantage of all the newly settled ranches and farms in Northern California and Eastern Oregon. It was also decided to build the line in narrow gauge as it was cheaper to build, and at that time, narrow gauge fever was in full swing. With the new plan set, the railroad was reorganized as the Nevada and Oregon Railroad in 1880, but raising the needed revenue by subscription was proving slow due to the local economy being impacted by a devastating fire the years before. As a result, the southern section was scrapped and construction northward started a year later with the first spike being driven in Reno, May 28th of 1881. Just a few miles south of the border, Willow Ranch today consists of only a few active and not so active dwellings. The site was most likely named after the Willow Creek that passes through here, but the town itself was actually first founded two miles to the east next to the base of the Warner Mountains. With the arrival of the railroad, as it drove northward, the town was moved in order to take advantage of this new mode of commerce, leaving little trace of its original founding place except for the town cemetery, which is the sole marker of the town's original location. After winning a government bid to produce 194 million board feet of timber, the Crane Creek Lumber Company moved its operations from Crane Creek Canyon, south of Lakeview, Oregon, and built a sawmill at the nearby Lassen Creek in 1928, as seen here. The sizable remains at Willow Ranch today are not of the town, but rather that of the industry that supported the town's existence, being a planing mill, box factory, planer, boiler plant, and drying kilns constructed at Willow Ranch by the Crane Creek Lumber Company. As can be seen with some aerial images looking eastward, the mill was quite sizable with a spur coming off the main line. Next to the mill, we can also make out the town that it supported. In 1936, the mill at Lassen Creek burnt down and the complex was renamed the Willow Ranch Lumber Company, which lasted until 1946 when it was purchased by Thomas Doggerty, who reformed it into the Goose Lake Lumber Company. Lasting until 1959, the whole show ended when the last loaded boxcar was shipped out in February of that year, spelling the end of the town, which at its height was home to over 600 residents that in one way or another depended on the mill for a living. Today, all that remains are the many foundations and one of the sawdust burners that was later added along with this memorial near the mill site in commemoration of what once was. One last item of note is that the Crane Creek Lumber Company also built a 16 and a half mile long logging line, 
that joined the NCO's tracks here in Willow Ranch, being built the same time as the Lassen Creek Mill in 1928. It ran southeast into the Warner Mountains and was operated by a single oil-burning shea, number one. It only lasted until 1930, with the tracks being removed in 1934. Continuing south, our train is once again dwarfed by its surroundings. Up until now, the Warner Mountains have been set back from the edge of the Goose Lake, providing open land for farmers and ranchers alike. South of Willow Ranch, the foothills now press up to the lake bed with the railroad traversing between these two geographical features, but it was the lesser known Applegate Trail that first blazed a path through here in 1846. The Applegate brothers and Levi Scott led the party that started near Ashland, Oregon, and went eastward to Goose Lake and over the Warner Mountains at Fandango Pass, where remains of the trail can still be seen. It was the only trail that would be blazed west to east and was created to make an alternative route from the Oregon Trail and its treacherous river crossings. Going southeast into the Warner Mountains, we enter into a valley leading up to Fandango Pass, which stands out on the ridgeline as the section with no trees upon it. Early pioneers would have brought their wagon trains over this ridge and into the valley below before continuing westward. One story told about the origins of the pass's name is that a party were so joyous in making the crossing over the pass that they danced the Fandango that night after making camp here in the valley. They, however, had thought they'd cross the Sierra Nevadas, which, unbeknownst to them, still lay ahead. Looking northeast, we can still make out the Goose Lake Basin and the location of Willow Ranch near the shimmering water center of shot. We depart Willow Ranch, rejoining our train as it continues rolling southward. With Sugar Hill looming in the background, we view number 614's progress around the promontory from a vantage point high up on Highway 395. All the while, a local tries his best to be heard above the wind. As 614 rounds the bend, we can hear the effort by the two jeeps as it carries through the air. Though far retreated, the railroad's right of way gives us a clear indication of Goose Lake's historic reach. Having passed Sugar Hill, the route straightens out once again as we head through open pasture and farmland to the town of Davis Creek and continue to the southern edge of the Goose Lake Basin. North of Davis Creek, we patiently await the arrival of the hauler. The line is currently classed as accepted track under the FRA's designation standards. This classification being the lowest designation for track operation limits the line speed to a maximum of 10 miles per hour as previously mentioned. This classification is primarily due to the lack of maintenance from previous operators of the branch. We will delve into this part of the line's history in part two. For now though, one cannot complain too much as it gives us plenty of time to set up for our shots.
Around this point, the line passes the southern end of the Goose Lake, and it was in this area that the Applegate Trail would turn westward at a junction with the Lassen Trail that was created by Peter Lassen in 1848 as a response to the California Gold Rush guiding prospectors to the gold fields in the northern part of the state. The Applegate Trail would head westward to the hills in the distance, and the Lassen Trail from here follows closely the present-day path of Highway 395 to Alturas. Nineteen miles south of the state border sits the small settlement of Davis Creek, whose history dates as far back as 1869 when the first log cabin was built here next to the creek from which the community takes its name. With a noted population of 150 people in 1913, today only 16 residents still reside in Davis Creek. Little of historical significance remains except the community church which was built in 1886 and which stands next to the main highway on Westside Road. Looking west on Westside Road, 614 and 106 pass by the town site with little fanfare. A mile south, the line takes a turn to the southwest, making a beeline to where the North Fork of the Pitt River cuts through the plateau at the southern end of the Goose Lake Basin. For the next eight miles, the line and the highway separate, so here we take to the air. The building of the line out of Reno was painstakingly slow, being hampered by constant financial issues and poor management. A simple lack of company bylaws resulted in the board of directors attempting to vote themselves 12,500 shares each in a bid to thwart an upcoming shareholders meeting to elect new board members. On the day of the shareholder meeting, these board members arrived with some of the laborers, all of which had not received any pay or reimbursement on their investment in the railroad thus far. Colonel Thomas Moore, in charge of the line's construction, demanded their removal, and though unclear why or how, a shootout broke out, with eight shots being fired, injuring one man and killing another. When all was said and done, the meeting was resumed, and a new board was elected. After yet more turmoil and leadership changes, the railroad had only reached 30 miles to Anita, California by 1882, and was completely shut down in 1883. In 1884, an auction of the then Nevada and Oregon Railroad was ordered by the court with early investors, New York banking firm the Morin Brothers, being the only bidders and thus took full control of the venture, providing the stable financial footing the line so desperately needed. Renamed the Nevada and California Railroad, construction would resume in 1885. With greater stability from the Morin brothers, the NNC reached Amity some 72 miles from Reno by 1890, where construction stopped for another nine years until more capital was raised. In this period, the railroad was renamed one more time to the Nevada-California-Oregon Railway, whose initials of NCO brought about two notable nicknames, the Narrow, Crooked, and Ornery, and the Northern California Outrage. 1899 brought with it a burst of activity with the NCO adding another 64 miles of track in two years, reaching the small town of Madeline just 31 miles south of Alturas, where work would halt once more until 1906. Now at the south end of the Goose Lake Valley, we reach the Pitt River. Here we leave behind the agricultural landscape swapping it out for woodland and the long straight stretches for tight curves as the line joined again by Highway 395 
heads into the Pitt River Canyon. After only having to contend with a ruling grade of only 0.2%, the Goose Lake crew start descending the steepest part of the line with a grade of 1%. From here, the line will parallel Highway 395 all the way into Alturas. There is a finesse required to keep the train under control as the engineer gently takes the hauler down the grade. Nicknamed baby tunnel motors, these units do not have dynamic braking, so everything is done with the train's air brakes. These units derive their nickname from the lower positioning of the radiator grills, much like their larger SD40 and 45T cousins. Here we see them rounding another curve where Thoms Creek joins the Pitt River. on the track are a reminder of how much of the land is still used for open-range cattle. Several fallen flags are represented in today's train, with hoppers from both the Rock Island and Chicago Northwestern present, though now lettered for the Midwest Rail Car Corporation. Another mile further, and we spot a rock cutting showing off the local geology and providing us with a nice backdrop.
further on, we see number 614 leading its train over one of the longer trestles on the line as it crosses over the Pitt River. Reaching the end of the canyon, we enter into Pitt River Valley, and the line levels out a little as it passes through the small locale of Surprise Station. the railroad did have a stopping point here and even built a freight depot. The locality never grew though and in 1915 the freight depot was moved to Old Turris to replace the one there that burnt down the same year. Post 464 is where Highway 299 joins Highway 395 behind where we are standing to view the passage of our train. Looking south, the compressed view exaggerates the track condition as our train navigates the dips and rises. Reaching the south end of the valley, the line is about a few short miles from Journey's End in Alturas and the interchange with the Union Pacific. Highway 395 hugs closely to the right-of-way all the way into town, making for good vantage points. At the south end of the Pitt River Valley, the line passes an impressive rock cut as it turns to the southwest towards the hub of Alturas. Seven hours after departing Lakeview, we reach milepost 460 and the outskirts of Alturas. The Warner Mountains fill the background as we look eastward. Located just east of the center of Modoc County, Alturas, with a population of over 2,700 people, is the county's largest town as well as the county seat. In the north end of town, the line crosses 12th Street, where Highway 299 enters from the west. Next to this crossing was the original location of the NCO's depot when the railway arrived in 1908. 
Here, the NCO also had a yard complete with a Y, which has all since been removed, but their outline can still be made out clearly from the air. Alturas would become the final center of operations for the Nevada-California-Oregon Railway, resulting in the construction of the railway's mission-style headquarters building, which stands today near the center of town. Located on Main Street, we catch number 614 on a sunny afternoon, leading its train past the old NCO headquarters building, working its way to the southern part of the town and Lakeview Junction. Moving to a vantage point just south of Alturas on Highway 395, we find the haulers crew wying their train at Lakeview Junction, where they are taking the north leg of the Y onto the surviving Modoc line. From here, they will reverse their train down the south leg of the Y and into the yard to tie it down. A Union Pacific crew is already making their way from Klamath Falls with cars for the Goose Lake to take back tomorrow morning. Arriving a few hours later, they will pull onto the north leg of the Y and tie their train down there before reversing down to the yard and hooking onto the train left behind by the Goose Lake crew before they themselves tie down and head to their hotel in town. Now at the north end of the Y, we see our crew performing their final act for the day. With the train just visible in the background, they head to the north end of the Y to tie down their power in a spur track, giving space for the inbound UP crew due later tonight. The conductor realigns the switch for his engineer and motions him forward. lining the spur switch behind them, the conductor then guides the power past the clearance point and to a final stop.
This concludes part one of our study and exploration into the Goose Lake Railway's Lakeview Branch and both Lake and Modoc counties. We certainly hope that you have enjoyed this film and that you will join us once again in part two as we return to Lakeview. Until then, be sure to subscribe for this upcoming film and much more. And from all of us at Sidetracked, thank you. <laughs>